without you, we can do nothing. Give us your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you sit down, could you just turn around and greet one another for a little bit, and then we'll come back with the rest of the service.
Okay, if we could head back towards our seats and stand again and turn to 318, Isaiah 53, 5. He was wounded for our transgressions, and by his stripes we are healed. The healer. the cross crucified in great sorrow he died thy giver of life was he yet my lord was despised and rejected of man this Jesus of Calvary he was wounded Came the leper to cry, saying, Surely I know that the Lord canst make me whole. When this great faith was seen, Jesus said, Yes, I will, and touched him and made him clean. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Surely he bore our sorrows, and by his stripes we are healed. He has healed my sick soul made me every with whole and he'll do the same for you he's the same yesterday and today and for a this healer of man today he was wounded he was bruised for our iniquities. Surely he bore our sorrows, and by his stripes. 
stripes, we are healed. You may be seated. Good morning. Welcome to Grace Baptist Church. We're so glad you could join us this morning. If there's anyone here for the first time, or the first time in a very long time, please raise your hand as the ushers go past. They'd like to give you a visitor's card and a gift. If you could put that visitor's card in the offering plate when it goes past in just a few minutes, we'd really appreciate having a record of your visit. Now, Brother Jerry will come and present the missionary report. This week, our missionaries is Mike and Pam Estridge with CPR Ministries, June and July. With the project at Bible Way in the hands of a new pastor, Pam and I have set out to answer some invitations from several supporting churches and consider future plans. On a loop through South Georgia, I preached for the Freedom Baptist Church in Milan, Georgia, and offered counsel regarding our current pastoral search. We also made a visit with our friends and supporters of the Bible Baptist Church of Hazelhurst. A quick stop in Jacksonville, Florida, allowed us to take care of some business of our BMFP mission office before heading to Statesboro, Georgia, to get acquainted with a new supporting pastor of Temple Baptist Church. From Georgia, we headed west to Nottasolga, not not Alabama, to preach in the Midway service at Christ Gospel, Christ Gospel Baptist Church. We don't want to say that ten times in a row. <laughs> the following Sunday, I was privileged to preach at the Heritage Baptist Church in our hometown of Opelika, Alabama. It was a great blessing to have my mom and dad in the audience that day. After a brief stop at home, we headed south once again to preach at Emmanuel Baptist Church in Valley, Alabama, and to Hinesville, Georgia, we had a wonderful opportunity to spend the weekend with Grace Baptist Church. After searching, after preaching for the men's prayers breakfast, we loaded up the van for a morning of door knocking in the community. On Sunday morning, I enjoyed preaching at the morning service. With the evening off, I got to enjoy the preaching of Pastor Gary Hendricks. We returned our, to our home in Trenton to finish the month with a somewhat rare occurrence. Over the years, we've spent more than a few anniversaries surrounded by camp kids, solving a maintenance crisis or traveling all day between meetings. The, this year, we celebrated our 44th with a Tennessee River boat cruise. Thanks for your prayers across the miles. Finally got it. You may remember that we reported in December how God had supplied funds for a cargo trailer suited for our ministry. After a very long search and dozens of COVID shortage stories, we located a com company which built us a great new cargo trailer. Thanks to all who gave toward this. Prayer request, pray for mom. In June, my mom, who's 86, was diagnosed with cancer. And after difficult surgery, and a week-long hospital stay in Birmingham, Alabama. She is home with speech and swallowing therapy. Knowing God's command to honor thy father and thy mother, Pam and I are taking time out of our travels to assist with their long, both mom and dad's long trips to specialists in Birmingham and their needs along the road to recovery. Many, many thanks for the calls, prayers, and special gifts during these days pray for Pam. We are now four months, three doctors, and two shots into the search for an answer to Pam's arm pain. Even small activities are now quite painful. Please pray for help and healing in our search as our search continues. Pray for upcoming Sunday school workshops in South Carolina, Arkansas, and West Virginia. Pray that God will add more, many more of these to our schedule. Thank you. Please take your bulletins. We'll look at some announcements. There are quite a few today. Of course, at the top, there will be a meeting uh, for planning and discussion of the junior church ministry right after the morning service. Pastor will have a few more things to say about that in a moment. On the 25th of this month, it's a Wednesday, the missionary Joshua Morris and his family will join us for our regular Wednesday service. The 4th of September is a Saturday. There will be a soul-winning kickoff breakfast 
at 9.30 with the soul winning following the breakfast. From the 12th to the 15th, that's a Sunday through a Wednesday, Evangelist Ben Everson will be preaching fall revival meetings here Sunday morning and then in the evenings on the weekdays at 6.30. And then the evening of the 12th, which is Sunday, they'll have a hymn sing. Other area churches have been invited. I believe at least one of them has said there uh, some people will be coming. The Graceway Bible Institute begins again on Tuesday, September 21st, the Old Testament survey course. And then the teachers meeting, of course, we will be having every week as usual at nine o'clock, Pastor. Thank you so much, Brother Aaron. I just wanted to thank everybody while I was gone to take to take care of things and still come back to see everything is in order. And I just praise the Lord for that. I wanted to encourage you too to take the Old Testament survey class. It's more of a college type class here. It'll be a part of the Bible Institute. Um, this is the last class that we will be teaching um, that will finish up all of the requirements. And some of the people that have been in that have done all of the eight classes that we put together. And uh, it has a syllabus, has a regular requirements and so on. But if you'd like to be part of that and not want to do all of the requirements, you can just come and audit the class and just enjoy the fellowship. And uh, Brother Mauricio will be preaching and teaching that class. Looking forward to that coming up rather quickly. There may be a Tuesday night or so that we've got to shift it over to a Thursday because of missions conference and different things, but just wanted to kind of give you a heads up on that. I wanted to say something about the junior church meeting after the service. I've, I've sent texts to some of you and asked you to really pray about considering serving the Lord. If you're a member of our church and you feel like God is leading you to help in any way, junior church is a way that you can do that. We want to be able to get the children out of the auditorium um, and, and get in, into the teen room. They'll be on the same floor here. And in there, uh, Brother, um, Brother uh, Olivares is going to show you in our meeting uh, how this program runs. We've got it from Striving Together. It is um, Bible Grace Stories. Um, and so it, the program is perfect for children. Um, I would rather see them in some kind of a place where it's organized, where they're, le they're learning from the scriptures rather than just drawing here in the auditorium while the preaching is going on. Um, I think we best if they're learning early on the Bible stories of God's grace. And so um, junior church has always been a little bit of a difficult keeping people in order. Uh, Brother Al Alfredo uh, Olivares has got an organization where he's got six teams. And so if you'd like to be part of that team, uh, there'll be two, two for a team. Uh, and then there's helpers. Position for you say, well, I don't want to be part of it as far as leadership, but I'd like to help then you also can come, and you teenagers can be part of it if you wanted to. Um, if you're o over the age of 11, 12 years old, and you want to help in there, we would like for you to come and be part of that uh, meeting that we're having after the service. If you feel like that's what you'd like to do, we'd like to meet in the teen room. I wanted to extend, too, just a little bit of a thank you for praying for my Uncle Pat. Uh, many of you have prayed for me. Um, this is the best day I've had since surgery, and I'm praising the Lord for it. I, I really think it's because I mowed the lawn. Uh, yesterday by Pushmore, and I think that might have helped me a little bit um, because I'm trying not to walk like an old person, and um, even though I am. And so uh, I think that's part of the stretching or something that happened uh, where I'm having a really good day, and I praise the Lord. But thank you for praying for my Uncle Pat. He did preach. Um, he wants to get back on the road. That's his livelihood. And so uh, thank you for praying for him. Uh, he got back into the pulpit with an oxygen machine, uh, for some reason, they had him on six uh, liters of oxygen, or four liters, rather than normally it's two. So he had a little bit more of an issue with his lungs um, because of the COVID-19 or the variants. We're not sure exactly what he had. Um, but if you just keep praying for the for the McCluskeys, they'll appreciate uh, the prayers. And we're so excited about Ben Everson coming. If you don't know who Ben Everson is, um, you can Google him, please do, and find out who this man is. We, we, we are very, very fortunate to have him come. Uh, his brother Joe was on Fox News. You might have saw uh, this individual singing the national anthem and then drawing a picture and painting a picture. That's Joe Everson, his brother. He turns the picture around here. It's American flag, all painted perfectly. And so 
pretty pretty talented family. Their father used to run the music department at Northland until the contemporary music came in and uh, moved him out. Um, but uh, so so there's really a desire for them to keep the music where it should be. Uh, so if you want to be part of that, those meetings, pray, pray, pray. Uh, the, the, the Sunday evening having the churches come here will be an exciting time on that Sunday night. Well, if the men come, we'll look for an offering. And again, it's a way that we can worship the Lord by giving back to him. He's been so gracious and so good to all of us. We want to continue to support uh, the Grace Baptist Church through the love offerings and through the, through the, through the giving. Brother, um, God established you. Could you pray for the offering, please? And I hope it's well with your soul. Please take your hymn books one more time and stand and turn to 533. Joy in serving Jesus, Jesus, others, and you. Jesus, as I walk alone with God, 
Tis the joy of Christ my Savior, who the path of suffering trod. There is joy, joy, joy in serving Jesus, joy that throbs within my heart. Every moment, every hour, as I draw upon his power, there is joy, joy, joy that shall never depart. There is joy in serving Jesus, joy amidst the darkest night. For I've learned the wondrous secret, and I'm walking in the light. There is joy, joy, joy in serving Jesus, joy that throbs within my heart. Every moment, every hour, as I draw upon his power, there is joy, joy, joy that never shall be barred. Good morning. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 2 this morning. We'll read the first 10 verses. Uh, once I'm done reading, we'll go back and read verse 5 altogether as our key verse. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth. And if we could go back and read verse 5 altogether, please. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day that you've given us today. I'm thankful that everyone here was able to attend this morning. I pray for the rest of the service, uh, that everything would go smoothly. I pray for the special music, and I would pray that you would give Pastor the strength this morning to give his sermon this morning, and I pray for the rest of the week that everyone would travel safely, and especially bring back everyone tonight for the evening service, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated.
you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter number two. I just want to thank the person who straightened up the rug here. Uh, up here, this rug was crooked for the last seven weeks or so, and and now it's all nice and straight. Thank you, because my back couldn't do it. Um, I wanted to do it. Um, I just might have mentioned it to one person. I'm not going to embarrass him, but thank you for making this. You know, if things aren't, I don't want to be preaching on a crooked rug. Um, I, I I don't think that would be good. You know. Uh, early on, when I was talking about leadership, I used to say, stay on your own rug. You know, this is my rug. Um, this is my responsibility, so to speak. And sometimes leaders try to go over into other people's leaders. And, and if we just kind of take care of our own rug, it'd be good. But the last seven weeks, I couldn't do that. Um, so thank you so much. Philippians, 18 different times. Christ is mentioned in chapter 1. Nothing comes out of this message this morning. I want you to know that sitting in a prison, Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, focusing on Christ. I think this is where our attitude would be completely changed in anything that we do if we would focus on Christ. And so just for a few minutes, it's 11 o'clock, about 11.32 I'll be done. And so I think it'll be important for you to understand, just for the next 32 minutes, if you could give me uh, your attention to place your mind on Christ, not on the cares that you have or the burdens that you bear or the responsibilities that you are trying to fulfill, but just for a few minutes, if you could give me the grace of focusing on Christ, I think you'll understand chapter 2 a little bit better. Um, and so I hope I can explain it to you. I, I think really that we're facing many personal problems and battles in our life really at this particular time. Um, and some of you are aging like me, and you do have more cares and more concerns. Someone in their late 80s or early 80s, I think, came to me and said, it's so hard to let go. Hard to let go of the things of this world, things that you have put time into, whether it was a business or whether it was your dream home or whether whatever it was. Uh, these things, you have to be careful that you do not hang on to them too tightly. We face battles and we face the battle in our homes to keep things orderly so things function peaceably. I understand that. We face battles in our own workplaces so things fall together and that we may work sufficiently and efficiently. And if you own a company or work for somebody that you really care for that does, and we need to be careful with all of this. And we face these battles, if you would, in our church, and we confront them, and so many function uh, effectively, and some fun function ineffectively, really because of not willing to prepare. Let me just say this about fundamental independent Baptist churches for a minute. I love fundamental independent Baptist churches. There is a, a, a thing going on right now. What's wrong with them? I think I'm going to write a book. What's right with fundamental independent Baptist churches? Because the list would be a whole lot longer than their complaint. I know that there are problems, and there are problems in every institution. And so if you think that any institution is not going to have problems, then you're living in a dream world. And because of it, I feel like I need to change my message tonight. It's going to be on bitterness. Because if you're not careful, dear friend, your expectations are going to be stripped from you. And you can become bitter. And if you do, you'll defile many. So how do we handle this? I think we need to be more biblical in our own personal walk with God and not just structured in a way where people look as if, wow, this is a spiritual person. Look what they've done. Did you realize that what you did yesterday has no bearing on what you're going to do in the future? So a thought will reap an action. If you sow a thought, you will reap an action. And if you sow an action, then you'll reap a habit. And if you sow a habit, you reap a character. If you find somebody with character and integrity, it came with their thoughts. That's where it all began. 
And of course, you sow a character and you reap a destiny. And that's not mine, that's somebody else's. But if you think about that for a moment, everything goes back to your battle that goes on within your own mind. And sometimes people battle things that we don't see going on in the brain. We may battle with habits that cause us harm sometimes if we're not careful. I have a problem with battle, the battle of the bulge because uh, I'll tell you, I look at a menu and I gain weight. It's just, it's amazing. If I see a hamburger on a sign, I, I, I feel stuffed because I, I, I've already eaten it in my mind, you know. If we're not careful, our minds can uh, take us. Yeah, go ahead and bring that up if you would. I don't I mind just coming up here and interrupting a little bit. doesn't matter because my... I'm only on one steroid a day, so it's not so bad. Before I was on six, it was a little hard to swallow. So, but I sent to one of my college friends that I was on steroids, and he sent me, he sent me Arnold Schwarzenegger picture. <laughs> so Gary Gomer, if you're watching, thank you for that. But I just wanted to kind of focus in on the battle of the brain for a minute, and the battle of the mind. So we battle these habits, and so some people have them, and I do have mine, to be honest with you. My mind seems to fall into, you ever have like a bicycle and you're riding along and you fall into a rut? You ever have that happen to you and you want to get your bicycle out of that rut? Or maybe your car goes off the road. Sometimes my mind will go into a rut if I'm not careful. I think you can determine whether it's a rut or it's a root problem. And you're praying that the rut problem will be taken care of. The root problem only Jesus can take care of through the blood. But I want to just kind of encourage you concerning this. I heard about a pastor that lost all kinds of weight, and he, because his biggest battle was donuts. So he's heading to church one day, and he passed the Dunkin' Donuts. They're, they're the ones that are screaming out. You've probably seen their pictures and probably drank their coffee. But he said to himself, Lord, I will only stop if there's a parking spot right in front of the door. And it took 10 times to circle the parking lot. <laughs> opened up. His brain weighs about three pounds. Two and a half to three pounds is all your brain. 120 trillion different nerve endings. We have an awesome God. You think computers are incredible? The human brain is incredible. I'm not a neurologist or anybody that actually has studied medicine, but I'll tell you, if I was, I'd probably write a track concerning how big our God is. But the brain is a wonderful organ. Someone said this, I think it was Robert Frost. He said it starts working the moment you get up in the morning. It doesn't stop until you enter the office and sit out. And everything seems to stop. The Bible's very clear about imaginations and thinking and does speak of it quite often, I think, one of the most quoted verses in my own mind are found in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And, and 3 through 5 says this, For though, though, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of the strongholds. This is where Reformers Unanimous got their uh, ideas from, was from the Word of God. The next verse says, casting down imaginations that every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And so even now, I think you understand that obeying the scriptures, obeying Jesus are the same thing. So we go to the scriptures and say that if I place then my thought life under the canopy of the grace of God, if I cast my imaginations, the Greek word for imaginations is the word reasoning, and so people can reason away if they want to. You ever meet someone like that? They are perfect in everything, and they'll, they'll reason. I don't even argue with them. They will reason everything away from looking at them in the mirror, and you just pray that God would show them who they really are someday, that God would change them because you can't change them. I say that sometimes to families because some ladies will say, well, I wish my husband would change, or the wife would say, um, you know, I wish my husband would change, or my, my, my husband would say, I wish the wife would change, and so on. If, if God can't change them, you can't. Okay. So give them to God. You say, well, I want to change my child. Give them to God. And, and fast and pray for that child. But there is the battle 
And the battle is the battle that we must fight. And I think we need to be encouraged with this instead of being discouraged. God called us to the winning side, and so we must fight the good fight. And so we arm ourselves then mentally, if you would. And so when we're talking about the brain and we're talking about the mind, we remember what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 1. He said, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. So you go on to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ in turning to our hearts to, to be able to think properly placing the Word of God within our hearts so that we know we can draw that out into our mind. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 8, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, for an helmet the hope of salvation. And we understand in Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about how that we ought to put on the helmet of salvation. To what? To protect our mind, if you would of the things of this world. So when we speak of the mind or our minds, we're talking about our brain or we're talking about what we think with. And so the battlefield really is in our thought life. And so you're sitting here right now and maybe this is your mind. The first one that I want to talk about is the distracted mind. You're already thinking about what lunch is going to be. You've already left me, if you would. And you're out there and you're trying to get a project done. Little things distract these people. They're able to look at things and look you in the eye, but they're thinking about something else because their mind is being distracted. So we are among people, and there are some in here that have distracted minds. There are some in here that have depressed minds. No matter how good things are in your life, you're depressed. No matter how good and positive things are going in the home, you come in with a dirge. You pull in the driveway and say, oh, I'm, I'm home again. You walk into the workplace and they go, oh, there he is again, Mr. Down and Out and full of depression. And so there are, if you would, understanding this, that there are distracted minds here, there are depressed minds here, but there are also double minds. Yeah. Double minds comes from a two-hearted person. I really don't believe that the lost person can be double-minded. I believe Christians can be because you know you have Christ within you. You know that you're supposed to be doing certain things. And through the years, you've been pushing away what you ought to do and finding excuses to blame somebody else. And you become double-minded. You'd like to go ahead and play with the world a little bit and then come to church on Sunday morning. You'd like to be able to look and act and listen to the same music, the world, watch the same TV shows, read the same books. Go ahead and be in tune with you would with Hollywood. Watch their movies and then act like you're okay or sing a good song or whatever. Let me tell you something, dear friend. Either you're going to be double-minded or you're going to be single-minded, focusing on the Lord. This is a battle, isn't it? But there are distracted minds here today. There are depressed minds. There are double-minded people here. There are also dirty minds. Everything is perverted. As soon as you say something, that mind says something else to, to pervert it because their minds are full of perversion. And, and I'm not talking about and picking on anybody individually here today, but I'm saying that these are the kind of minds that are here among us today. And so we have to be gentle to understand what kind of mind do I have? Is my mind in, 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 like the mind of Christ? Well, the scripture says in verse number five, let this mind be in you, talking about letting it happen. You can have the mind of Christ, and you can think like Christ thought. The Apostle Paul was writing to the people at Philippi and letting them know that their joyful fellowship in life depends on their minds and how they need to protect their thought life. And I really think there's two, maybe three major mindsets here in the passage that will bring out the maintaining the joy within the church. And the first one is like-mindedness. I think in church, to be healthy, there needs to be like-minded people who have the same goal. Do you ever, hear, you ever hear somebody say amen in church? You ever hear that? You see, it happens way down in here, you know, somewhere. And it kind of moves its way up to the mouth, you know. Kind of goes up from the stomach and then, amen! You say, well, did I say that? You know? And that's something that actually is a good thing because you're saying, I'm like-minded. I'm saying, so be it. I'm saying, yes, I agree. 
uh, sometimes when we have people say amen, it means that they're like-minded. What produces like-mindedness, I, I think, is, is, is also produces lowly-mindedness. Lowly-mindedness is when we're talking about humility. But let me just give you the motivating factors that influence the believer's thought life in verse number one. And let me just use that for the main point, if I could. I, I would say, if you're taking notes, motivating factors that influence the believer's thought life is found in verse number one. And so if you look at verse number five and you say, well, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, and then it goes on to explain what Jesus was like, I also believe if you go back and you read the first four verses, you're understanding a little bit more about what he's talking about, let this mind be in you. Because if this mind was in you, then you're going to be able to understand who Christ is and walk with him. So the first thing we see in verse number one, it says, if there, and by the way, in, in the Greek structure, um, we could read this verse a couple of ways. Let me just read it to you in the English, plain um, King James Bible. If there be, if, 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 if there be therefore, because of what was said earlier, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies. Now, if you look at that verse, you would say, um, that it's saying it's a supposition, so if we have this. It's true because of the word any is mentioned four times. You can circle those, any, 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 four times. So any, any, okay, so if you take away the any and you don't have Christ living within you, then really this, this is really it doesn't mean anything to you. But if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, since this has happened, these are the things that you have. And so he's writing this letter out to the church at Philippi and saying to them and motivating them that these are the influences of the believer that will help them to be able to uh, be like-mindedness, like-minded and have lowliness of mind. If there be these things, any consolation in Christ, what does that mean? Well, I think really if we talk about consolation, we're talking about a comfort, but we're talking more than that. If we were thinking about strong consolation, then we will go to Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 18, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation, same word, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. But we also see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 16, we also see an everlasting consolation. So we have not only a strong consolation, but we also everlasting, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 16 says, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and God even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. So what does consolation mean? Well, a better rendering in English word would be exhortation, if you would. If there be any exhortation in Christ, and so we have this indwelling presence of Christ, that is a perpetual internal consolation, exhortation to correct us and to guide us. That's part of what he's saying here, that we have Christ with us, that indwelling of the Spirit of God to be able to give us what we need to, to continue on. Some of you sense this when there's good preaching. Some of you are sitting there and you're hearing somebody preach the Word of God and you're agreeing with it, and pretty soon your heart wants to leak through your eyes. It's part of having a tenderness for God, and you sense the Spirit working within you, and that's the Holy Spirit guiding you. That's Christ in spirit form in you, the Holy Spirit, giving us that desire. And so we have the indwelling presence of Christ. That presence stimulates us. It quickens us. It is the life of the Christian soul. And it is that life that is, it diffuses, is diffused through, through, through all the members of the body, if you would, and through all the branches of the one vine. And remember that he is the vine and you are the branch. So stop worrying. When I look at a tree this morning, the branches weren't going, oh my, what am I going to do? I don't know if I'm going to be, everything is based on the vine, if you would, not the branch. The vine is fine. Jesus Christ is fine. You are the branch. So remember to rely upon him. Stop worrying so much. America, stop worrying. 
God's got everything in control. You know who needs to worry a little bit this morning? The people of Afghanistan. The Christians of Afghanistan. Will any country help them? You know what their desire is, really? It's not Afghanistan, it's Israel. How can we get to Israel? I'm so thankful I live in America. Is it important for us to pray for America? To be saved? Absolutely. The last beacon of light throughout all the world. America, the beautiful. I still believe in that. I think it's important for us to understanding, understand, though, that the branches really need to be careful because we need not worry. We're part of the vine. And so, really, their spiritual life is one. Nudity aids its development. Discord distunts its growth. When I'm talking about the body of Christ, I'm talking about not only those that are going to church, Going to church is the gathering of the church. We are the church. We're the called out ones. We understand that. But we're called out of the world to gather in assembly like this one to be able to open up the scriptures and understand what they say so that we can live the kind of life we need to live. So first of all, if we're looking at this particular verse, we see what consolation we have in Christ, consolation. But it also says that we have comfort in love. Look, at there. therefore, any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, love is so powerful. I was thinking about some of the refugees coming into Camp Douglas. What's going to change their hearts? Christ. And how can we show them the love of Christ? How can we show them authentic love? It's our responsibility if the mission fields come, comes here, if, the mission, if God allows that to happen, we must show them. And that enduring love that God gives to us, we can show them how much he loved them and gave himself for it. And if you compare the two understandings of, of what they think as far as religion, they look at Christianity and say, oh, my goodness, a God who laid his own life down? So we have this comfort of love, a comfort that comes springing out of love. So love is the subjective result of the presence of Christ and an objective reality, and with love then comes comfort. The Bible says this in 1 John chapter 5, verse number 1. Whoso believes in Christ, that, that Christ is born of God, and everyone that loves him that begat loves him also that is begotten of him. And by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous to us. Amen. It's something that we want to do because we love God, we love him, and we desire to do what is right. So the, the, the felt comfort of Christian love is what is needed. I was thinking this morning and preparing this a little bit extra on it this morning that, that love is the bond of unity. It is the, the bond of unity within the home. It, it's between the husbands and wives first. And, and by the way, if you think you're going to grow up Christian, good, godly kids without mom and dad being on the page, it's not going to happen. You're going to try to, and, and they'll glean some things from some other couples perhaps, but moms listen to me and dads listen to the show that you love each other and, and make sure that your love, you know, God is up here and here's mom and here's dad. And you draw toward God, you'll draw close together and your kids will see that. You want harmony in the home, mom and dads, then love one another and show the children and then you'll have a church full of people who love each other. But I was thinking about this morning, and I put down here that the mutual love of Christian binds together the Christian church, and the truest joy springs out of love. Love comforts and blesses with a holy joy, the heart that entertains its sacred influences. The experience of the blessedness of Christian love should draw Christians nearer to one another and ever closer, closer union. The Bible talks about that in Colossians chapter 3. We read so many of these verses, but toward the end, or toward the middle of the chapter of Colossians 3, this morning in Sunday school, we were reading them. Let me just read a few verses. It says, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. And if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Yeah. 
And above all these things, put on love or charity. That's love with shoes on, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Because love ever gives, forgives, outlives, ever stands with open hands. And while it lives, it gives, for it is love's prerogative to give and then to give and give. So love has so much to do about really what's going on within the heart. It's not nothing about really feeling, if you would. A young man said to his father at breakfast one morning, Dad, I'm going to get married. How do you know that you're ready to get married, asked the father. Are you in love? I sure am, the son said. How do you know that you're in love, asked the father. Well, last night, I kissed my girlfriend goodnight. Her dog bit me. I didn't feel any pain at all. Must not have been a mailman. Sometimes we think that it's all about feeling, and it isn't, dear friend. It's about truth. Yeah. And if you read Second John, you'll see the truth in love. Yeah. It's almost the place where truth is elevated. Yeah. Because I'll tell you what, if I really love you, I'll tell you the truth. Yeah. If I don't love you, I will hide things, and I won't tell you the truth. So second, thirdly, but then we have the fellowship of the Spirit. We see that in here. We see these are part of it. It's necessary for us to go through them. I should go rather, rather quickly. We have the fellowship of the Spirit. What is this talking about? Joint participation, really, with the Spirit of God. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 13, verse number 14, in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. And sometimes when you think about the Holy Spirit giving us that, that kindness and that needed comfort, it comes from the Spirit of God. Number four, we also see in this particular verse, we have the tender emotions and compassion. If you would, look at the Old English. If we have fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, what that's talking about really is having an understanding that we have a emotional compassion toward other people that are moved within the heart, the tender feelings of the Christian heart. The life of Christ is the soul, the presence of the blessed spirit. Lead the disciple to imitate his Lord, to learn his tenderness and his compassion. And Paul's asking the church at Philippi to show their love and their compassion for him by living in unity. And if these spiritual truths are real facts to you, he says, verify in your own experience, fulfill you my joy, be of one spirit, in your heart toward one another. These are the motivating factors that influence our thought life in the Christian circle. And so if we have verse number one in tune, we understand that you're going to be able to fulfill you my joy, that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Look at the oneness that's there. But he's going on to say, let nothing be done through in strife or vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, so you have in verse number two, the like-mindedness. In verse number three, you have the lowly-mindedness. Really, you have the love-mindedness also wrapped up into an understanding that if I have these things within my, my domain, my, my home, my heart, my, 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 my responsibility, then God is going to bless it. And he's saying, fulfill you my joy by understanding you have all of this in Christ. Not left alone. And so then we have the manifestation, if you will, or the manifested fruit that identifies the, believes, the believer's thought life. And so there's going to be an automatic like-mindedness. There's going to be the lowly-mindedness and the love-mindedness. And so the opposite of all that God desires from us is selfishness. It's the complete opposite. But we're living in a self-centered world. And I don't want to talk about the world because we know that. You pull out of here and people cut you off or whatever on your way home. They want to get into the drive through before you. Sometimes you're trying to park at Culver's and you can't find a spot because people are just like on their phones and they're in their car, not thinking about anything else but themselves. Yeah. And you're trying to get to the drive through at Culver's and you start crying because you can't get there. 
But really, selfishness is the root of sin. Selfishness is living in and for ourselves. It manifests itself in various aspects. First of all, in our thoughts. Get this. Three minutes left. Self becomes the largest figure in a man's conception of the universe. The shadow of self lies across everything else. The merits of self are magnified in pride. Vanity craves that admiration, a- admiration of others for oneself. Self-worship makes a man prejudiced in holding to his own opinions and bigoted in rejecting those of other men and will have a tendency to be a very lonely person. A person in his thought life being selfish will someday live in an apartment through his 70s, through his 80s, and into his 90s by God's grace, all alone with just Fox News to keep him busy. That's all. Selfish also in feeling. Self-love fills a selfish man's heart. He has no grief to another's trouble, no pleasure to another's joy. He may fake it. Instead, he's feeling as a member of a great body moved by the common pulse of a common life. He is likely a solitary cell detached and self-concentrated in his feelings. And he may give a $5 bill once in a while but that's only in a surplus. Then in action, self will becomes the predominating energy and self-seeking, the prevailing motive. It is extreme development that becomes positively cruel, a pursuit of one's own pleasure through the pain of others. Now all this is sinful in the sight of God and man, and frightfully injurious to society, war, crime, intemperance, all springs from some form of selfishness. Fight it, dear friend, because in order to have the mind of Christ, you will not be able to be selfish if you have his mind. Look what the Bible says in verse number 5. The Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And it began with mom and dad at the age of 12 when he came back and then they, they found him in the temple. And from that point on, he was obedient to his mom and dad. And even Hebrews tells us that Jesus himself had to be obedient, humble himself. Pretty powerful. But this mind needs to be in us. We need, we need the hour. It's verses 5 through 8. It's the need of the hour. But let me just read to you, Wherefore God also hath, verse number 9, highly exalted him and given him a name of but every name, that the name of Jesus at the name of Jesus, not Buddha, yeah. not even Allah, yeah. the name of Jesus. Amen. The name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things. Like, do you know why? Because he created all things. Yeah. And he deserves the preeminence. I think what's interesting is if we look at verse number 13, for it is God that works in you both to will and to do good, his good pleasure. He gives you the will, then he gives you the power to do it. Where's it coming from? comes from him, the need of the hour. There is a battle for your mind and for your brain. Without God, your thoughts will be in a never-ending battle. So I I battle with my thought life, Pastor. Then get into the scriptures. Every time you have a bad thought, say, I'm placing this thought underneath the canopy of God. And I'm saying, God, I don't know where that thought came from, but would you please, I submit this to you, would you forgive me for it? And he will give you the strength to move on. He'll take it away. Let the mind of the master be the master of your mind. Let the mind of Christ involves humility. Humbling action will bring bring glory to God. Humility does not mean thinking less of yourself than other people, nor does it mean having a low opinion of your own gifts. It, it, it means freedom from thinking about yourself in any way at all. Yeah. 
It's thinking about other people. That's a humble person who's going to be thinking about you. And Jesus Christ is that man. And he is that example because he walked all the way up those roads up to the cross and he laid himself down and they, they beat him to a pulp. He did it for you and I. He didn't have himself in mind. He had you in mind. And the Bible says, of course, let this mind be in you. And finally, my brother, and whatsoever things that are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And the only way that you can have the mind of Christ is to go to church. No. Gathering right now is not giving us any grace. You are here because God gave you grace. But maybe you haven't experienced it yet. Maybe you have a head knowledge of who God is, but it never came to your heart yet. I was thinking about an individual this last week that I want to get to, and I was thinking, how could I take a verse and show him that it's not just about going to church, it's not just about memorizing certain things or creeds or whatever. How can I get him to understand? And the Lord seemed to take me to John chapter 1. To them gave he power to become the son. To as many as received him. It's going from the head knowledge to saying, now I know what I need to do, and taking in, what was that definition of faith, Brother Mauricio? What was the definition of faith? Just making the decision. I'm going to receive you, Lord Jesus. I believe, and now I receive. Is that you today? God wants you to come. Come to him. Maybe you've never made that decision. Today would be the day that you gave your heart to him. Every head bowed and every eye closed for just for a moment. Maybe you're here this morning and say, Pastor, the, the message is what I needed today. I've been thinking about everything but what I needed to be thinking about. I see that the Apostle Paul had Christ on his mind. But I need your prayers. I'm saved but would you pray for me that I would have the mind of Christ? Is there anyone like that? Say, I'm struggling. Would you pray for me? I'm saved, but I need Jesus Christ on my mind. Lift your hand. Thank you. Lift your hand if you need. Thank you so much for the honesty. Thank you. Maybe you're here today and you never put your faith and your trust in God and in Jesus. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, Jesus said. For in my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. He's basically telling us that you need to take a step further from just knowing that there's a God. You believe in Jesus also, that God sent his Son, Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Wouldn't you want to have everlasting life? I sure do. Because the alternative really, really is bad. So come to Christ today. Maybe there's somebody here who would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I'm not sure I'm going to heaven when I die. I'm not sure. But I would like to be sure. I won't point you out. But I'll pray for you. Would you just slip your hand and say, Pastor, would you pray for me? Because I'm not sure I'm going to heaven but I would like to know. Is there anyone like that? Just lift up your hand. Put it back down again. Any more? Thank you so much. Put your hand down. If you wanted to come right after the service, and I can have someone show you from the scriptures. If you're a man, you come down. I'll have a man show you. We have a conference room. He'll go in there and show you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. If you're a lady, I'll have a young lady show you exactly how you can be sure you're going to heaven. This is an invitation. Churches don't do it much anymore. But we need to respond to God's call. And if his spirit is pulling upon your heart, then you come. Maybe it's just to pray at an old-fashioned altar. You come. Father, I pray that you bless the invitation. In Jesus' name.
much room for you. One more stanza. Would you please stand? No one looking around. Would you please stand? And if you need to come, you come. Say, yes, Lord, yes. Have your will. Have your way. I had an opportunity to go to the library when I was up at the Northwoods Conference Center. They have a huge library. And in there, my wife found a picture of Billy Sunday preaching. Uh, 60, it was in the 60s. Like it gave me hope, man. I said, wow, he was in his 60s and he was going like this. I was thinking of Billy Sunday and how he used to run the bases faster than anybody else could. Sometimes they would think about, I'm only 90 feet from home. 90 feet from third plate to the home base. 90 feet from the back of the auditorium to the front is only 15 feet. Sometimes it's 20 feet. Maybe somebody's only just 20 feet away from saying yes to Christ. Yes to being home. Then don't go to bed tonight without giving your heart to Jesus Christ. You don't need me there. You need Jesus there. His spirit will work in you even long after I'm dead and gone. His spirit's still going to be working. He'll work in you. After the sermon's over and after we go on to lunch, God is still going to be working in you. Do you know what? That's a wonderful thing. When that's gone, you think it's bad now. It's going to get a whole lot worse once the Christians are gone. But let me just say this before I go. There's going to be a rapture first before it really hits. So be careful. Stay close to God, because it could happen at any moment. Amen? Still plant a tree. Go pick your garden tomorrow. Still plant with plants. But just be ready in case he comes. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Brother, if God established you, would you make your way up here again? I'm picking on. This is God established you pick on day. So I really, I really appreciate it. Why don't you make your way up here and close our service with a word of prayer. And uh, God wants you to come back tonight. I know he does. I'm going to be preaching. I've got two sermons. The Renew Your Altar. There's also one on bitterness that I'm considering tonight because I think what happens with Christians, if we're not careful, what happens with our bitterness is we defile other people. We don't need to. We need to be careful. Um, so you pray for me as I decide. But come back at 6, you would, tonight, 6 o'clock. Be nice to see you. God establish you. Would you pray? All right, let's pray. Um, Lord, uh, thank you for the messages, both in the Sunday school and the sermon, that, uh, Lord, you work in us to not be selfish and instead look to see your invisible face through Jesus Christ and in so fulfill our purpose for you here on earth. Pray that this week we all do that during the week and glorify you among everybody here in the city of Madison or where we live, where we work. In Jesus' name, amen. When nobody wants to listen, who am I going to lean on?